Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our HCC webinar, The Many Faces of Advocacy. In 2018, we'll be expanding on each of the topics and skills our presenter, Patrick Lynch from Believe Limited, touches on today. The core of this series is building strong advocacy skills and demonstrating how to use them in all facets of everyday life. Patrick will answer questions at the end, so please use the chat function within the webinar. I just sent a chat to all of you, so you should see that pop up. Please use that to submit questions that you have throughout the presentation, and Patrick will answer as many as he can at the end. Uh, you should have been automatically muted when you joined the webinar. Uh, if you aren't muted, please do so now to minimize background noise. And with that being said, I will turn it over to Patrick Lynch. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, I'm hopeful that you all can hear me. I believe I've taken myself off mute now. Uh, my name is Patrick James Lynch. As Robin said, I am uh, from a company called Believe Limited, and I'll be leading us through the many faces of advocacy webinar this morning. And again, as Robin said, future, um, future webinars in this series will go deeper into each of the various areas that we're going to touch upon today. The goal of today really is to give you an overview of the many different areas where advocacy plays an important role in our lives, um, review some core principles that apply to advocacy in any setting, and give a couple of examples of uh, uh, the role of advocacy in the various uh, arenas that we're gonna discuss in today's webinar. Okie doke. Oh, there we go. Um, so an overview of this uh, educational webinar series at large, the Hemophilia Council of California's webinars are open to participation from all members of the public and will help patients maintain access to care, understand and pursue treatment, utilize freedom of choice in selecting medication and provider services, and advocate for self-care. This is the first webinar in this series, and mark your calendars now on September 21st at 12 noon Pacific time, Insurance 101, Preparing for Open Enrollment. That will be the next webinar again on September 21st at 12 noon. So what are we gonna go over today? Uh, today, I'll give you a brief introduction to, uh, as to who I am and why it is that I'm speaking to you. Uh, what advocacy actually is, it's a word that gets used a lot, but we'll just kind of, before we even get started, just take a moment to define what it actually means. Identify a few core principles of advocacy, and then get into these various areas where advocacy plays an important role in our lives, in the clinical setting with insurance and insurance companies, with pharm pharmacies, home health companies, and, and industry. Uh, in school, with government and elected officials, public policy, and advocacy and social media, and how those two things interact. We'll wrap up by, again, reviewing those core principles that we're going to look over here in just a moment, and then uh, have time for a Q&A. We should be wrapping up at about 1 p.m. Who are you, Patrick James Lynch? Well, um, I will tell you. I am a 31-year-old who lives in Los Angeles with severe hemophilia A. Uh, and I'm the CEO of Believe Limited, which is a digital content agency and production house responsible for programs within the bleeding disorders community, such as Stop the Bleeding, comedic web series about bleeding disorders, Powering Through, and inspirational speaker series on obstacles and challenges, the Team Impact Awards, an awards uh, ceremony that's held at National Hemophilia Foundation, recognizing impactful teens from the community, and Bloodstream Media, a podcast media company producing uh, four different podcast series for the bleeding disorders community. You can learn more about all that stuff if you care to at believeltd.com. Uh, then the next three things are just little identifiers that let you know a uh, few people think that sometimes what I have to say is worthwhile. And the last thing there is uh, probably why I'm here today, which is that in 2014, I had some notable struggles with Kaiser Permanente and, uh, Permanente, and I got a pretty um, hands-on experience of the importance of advocacy in uh, what, what for me was a crisis situation. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit later in the webinar. So what, what is advocacy? Again, we hear the word used a lot. So I thought I would just pull three different definitions from Merriam-Webster, dictionary.com, and the Oxford Dictionary. Advocacy is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. 
the act of pleading for, supporting, or recommending, or active espousal. There's a word you don't get to hear every day. Public support for or recommendation of a particular cause or policy. So essentially, advocacy is throwing your support behind a particular initiative. And that is a pretty broad definition, which is why it does apply to many aspects of our lives. And we hear the word used so often. Core principles that apply to advocacy in any arena. Number one, you want to establish a specific goal for your advocacy. What is your intended outcome? And that may sound pretty obvious, but a lot of times when we're advocating, we're doing so because something is not quite right. Uh, we're in some type of a stressful situation. It might not be an emergency situation, but chances are it's not the most comfortable, which means we're more likely to be a little bit rattled, a little bit nervous, a little bit emotional, uh, and making sure that we start our advocacy efforts with a very specific goal so that when in doubt, we can take a breath, come back to that goal, and make sure that we're executing in such a way that we are trying to achieve that intended outcome. So along those lines, we wanna develop a clear and concise argument for our advocacy efforts. And it's often also useful to incorporate personal experiences. Develop a clear and concise argument because, for example, if you're advocating with, say, a state uh, elected official about a particular bill that you want support for, you're gonna have a limited amount of time in that office, and even more importantly, you're gonna have a limited amount of time in the consciousness of that representative. They're hearing from people all day, every day, many, many, many good causes being brought to their attention. We need to make sure that we are clear and concise. And that personal experience really helps separate just hearing a series of facts and numbers and hypotheticals, uh, and it brings out the humanity in the story. And I, I've been a part of, and I'm sure many people on this webinar have, uh, plenty of advocacy moments with government officials where you can see and feel in the room when someone starts to tell their personal story of how X, Y, or Z affected their life with a bleeding disorder, you can just feel the room uh, shift a little bit. Personal experiences go a very long way. Educate yourself first, educate others next, and avoid preaching. Um, I have to be honest, I struggle with this immensely when it comes to certain things like uh, when we were pushing so hard for the defeat of the Better Care Reconciliation Act the last few weeks. Uh, friends and family who just don't see eye to eye to me necessarily, eye to eye with me necessarily, uh, it can be really hard for me to avoid that preaching component. And sometimes I forget that I've got to make sure I have my facts in order before I start going out and trying to rally people behind my cause. So educate yourself first, then educate others, and do your best to avoid preaching. Whenever possible, be proactive. Oftentimes when we are advocating, uh, we are responding to something. There was an incident uh, with our insurance company, there was an incident at the school, there was an incident at the hospital, whatever the case may be, we are often reacting. But there are many opportunities to prepare ourselves uh, to be a good advocate and put ourselves in a position for success. We'll get to that a little more later on in the webinar. Utilize community and support network to help you. Um, this is a really important point, and I think we here in California are particularly um, privileged to have so much support, organized support from our chapters, from the council, from the leaders in our community. Um, use that community and use that support. That sounds obvious, but I, I have to remind myself often enough to reach out to people when I am in need. Um, I have a story I'm going to tell a little later about um, Carrie Atkinson, who's the executive director of the Hemophilia of Iowa, and her son, Bo, has um, hemophilia and inhibitors, and we were talking recently in an event, and I'd asked her, what do you think the importance of community is? What's so valuable about community, community, community? And I thought she put it really well. She said, you know, community lets you know who you can call um, when a certain problem comes up in your life. And I thought that was really, really wise and a, a very concise way to put put a definition on um, what the value of community really is. Records help, log infusions, bleeds, calls with insurance, et cetera. Having a record of what took place when you are um, trying to advocate, you know, midway through some type, of, uh, some type of crisis or incident or issue is immensely important. And I'll speak specifically to that later when I tell a bit more of my personal story with Kaiser Permanente. Be mindful of your audience and be mindful of your image. Um, if you are meeting with that, that state senator, for example, it's probably worth your while at the beginning of the meeting to just um, ask the senator, are, are you familiar with bleeding disorders? Would you like me to give you a little bit of background before you launch into you know, what you're there to do? And chances are that senator will say, you know, yeah, I'm a little bit familiar, but that would be really helpful, thank you. If you are advocating at your hemophilia treatment center and the hematologist walks in the room, 
you probably don't need to ask them that question. Chances are they, got, they know what they need to know about bleeding disorders. So you wanna know who your audience is. It'll help you craft your argument and come up with your advocacy plan specifically tailored to that individual and that goal. And likewise, be mindful of your image. That's not to say make sure you're always wearing a, a suit and tie or uh, you know, your best formal wear for, for a meeting with a representative. But it, it, it's just advice to be aware that the way you present yourself, whether we like it or not, um, it has something to do with how we are received by others. And again, we have limited time often when we're advocating and speaking to uh, people who can help our cause and every little thing matters. So be mindful of your image and how you present yourself. Lastly, be professional, be patient, and be persistent. Um, this is another one that I sometimes struggle with. Not so much the professionalism or the persistence, but the patience part. That's a tricky part for me, but it's important. Again, we wanna make sure that we are presenting us, ourselves well. We're giving people a reason to want to hear what we have to say and support what it is we are um, espousing um, or advocating for. Um, and we have to be patient, but we also have to be persistent. It's not enough. We've all sent an email to somebody that we need an answer from and haven't heard back and needed to send that follow-up. And then we immediately get, oh, so sorry, I've, I've been swamped, blah, 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 blah. I send about 10 of those a day myself. Um, so oftentimes things don't happen right away, not for any malice, not for any bad reason. It just takes time. But there's often a lot of other considerations that people have in their plate. So don't be afraid to be a little bit persistent when you're advocating for your needs. Okay, so let's take a look at these various settings and talk a little about how those principles play out in these various arenas. The first being clinical care. And I have a quote here from my former pediatric hematologist, Dr. Donna D. McKelly, who's currently uh, working for the National Institute of Health. But she used to say to me growing up all the time, no one knows your body better than you. Listen to it. And I think that's really important. In many ways, we are our body's best advocates. And it's important that we keep in mind hemophilia treatment centers, the model is it's an integrated and collaborative care model, which includes and is centered around the patient. I think sometimes it can be easy for us as patients to forget that our input and our, our contributions to conversations in the clinical setting are as important as the hematologists, as the social workers, as the nurses, as the physical therapists, the dentists, the, you know, everybody else. It's, it's all built around you, the patient. And it's important that you are um, expressing what it is that you believe you need, even if it is not necessarily, uh, if you don't see eye to eye with your, with your clinicians right away, that's okay. And I'm going to tell a story about that in just a moment. Establish goals for comprehensive visits. This is something I've neglected to do from time to time over the course of my life. And I always, on the, on the other end of those comprehensive meetings, remind myself it's important to walk in with a goal, not just to check the box of, okay, I went to the center, I'm not really having any issues lately, so I'm just going to kind of go through it. They're going to ask me some questions and draw some blood. Come prepared. Know what the, each team has, know what value they can add to your care and to your life, and take full advantage of the services that are provided. We are very fortunate to have this comprehensive treatment model, this integrated care model um, as a standard. And again, here in California, we are particularly fortunate with the care that we have. Use it. Take full advantage of it. What's new? Ask questions, especially these days. New treatment options, new scholarship opportunities, new stretches or exercises, information on camps, patient organization activities, new clinical trials, studies. There is a lot going on in our community. Take advantage of being in the room with these experts. They have their finger on the pulse of all of this. Um, and while the hematologist may not know the, the, mo the most updated information about uh, summer camps in the area, chances are the social worker does. Um, but perhaps you won't think to ask, uh, mention it that day. So again, know what your goals are, know what each individual on that team is, is there to help you accomplish, and ask questions, and ask, spend, the, spend the time wisely. Listen to your body, reminder, you are its number one advocate. And are all of your medical needs being met? Are you mentally and emotionally healthy? Uh, is your pain management plan working for you? Something else that my, my hematologist used to tell me, don't chalk every problem up to hemophilia. Keep in mind that you're a human being who's uh, permitted to have any slew of medical challenges, complications, issues arise. Listen to your body um, and, and pursue, be curious about what's going on with you. And I think particularly, you know, mental, mental health, emotional health, depression, pain management, um, uh, addiction, these are things that are real issues in our community. And make sure that you are uh, accounting for those needs as well, not just some of the more um, I guess, for lack of a better word, traditional considerations when you're at your treatment center. 
Again, records help. If you're able to walk in with an infusion log and a log of your bleeds and how long it took to resolve, that's going to help your team work with you on refining your plan to make you even healthier. Without those records, it's really hard to know uh, how to make any kind of alterations to improve your care. Records help. I mentioned Carrie a little while ago from Iowa. So her, again, her son, Bo, has hemophilia and an inhibitor. Um, and he's had a pretty nasty inhibitor um, for, for most of his life, for pretty much all of his life. And at times, it's been as, as high as 32 Bethesda units, which is quite high for those of you familiar with inhibitors. Um, so it got to a point where Carrie felt like she really needed a second opinion. And it was not a knock on the treatment center in Iowa, but she felt that the community in Iowa was rather small. The clinicians there are not seeing as much variance in hemophilia and inhibitors and how they express. So she just went to the next state over to Illinois to, uh, to Chicago to see Dr. I think maybe Dr. Tarantino? No, he's in Peoria. I forget what doctor, but she went to get a second opinion from a hematologist in Illinois who gave her some other ideas about uh, treatment approaches that might be successful for Bo. Because at the time she went, she was infusing him every two hours for a nasty bleed when his inhibitor was so high. Every two hours for three days. Uh, not sustainable. So she needed, she needed some other advice. And she got it. They had some other ideas in Chicago that were able to help uh, Bo. And when Carrie went back to Iowa and went back to her treatment center to talk through those ideas, and they found it was successful with Bo, the treatment center then adopted that practice uh, for other children who are having similar type issues with their inhibitor and resolving bleeds. So by advocating for herself and pursuing a second opinion, not because she didn't trust her treatment center, but because she felt that there might be other experiences that are worth mining, not only was she able to get better care for her son and give her family a more sustainable way of life, but she was also then, because she brought that information back to her center, she also did a tremendous uh, service to the rest of the community. She was saying some of the moms have called her a trailblazer in Iowa because of that. So I think it's also worth um, keeping in mind that often when we advocate for ourselves, if we're vocal about it and connected to the community, we're actually advocating for many, many, many other people as well. Advocacy and insurance. Um, I have heard Michelle Rice, the Senior Vice President of uh, Public Policy and Stakeholder Relations at National Hemophilia Foundation, say this over and over and over again, so I'm just stealing it from her. Know your plan, know your plan, know your plan, and if you're selecting a plan, know your needs, know your needs, and know your options. Uh, the single most important thing is to truly underst understand the terms of your plan. And your plan needs to, again, consider your whole health, not just the bleeding disorder, but everything that you and perhaps your family um, need out of your health insurance plan. It's your responsibility to be your, your own expert. Again, use the community, use your support network as you need it. Um, these things can be intimidating. The amount of mail that comes to the house can be intimidating. But as Michelle says, open it all and read it all. Um, and when you are selecting a plan, be very mindful of all the considerations that you and your family have so that you're picking a plan that best meets the most of your needs. Ensure you have clarity on how factor is covered. That is perhaps the single most important part of the plan. Know how factor is covered. Um, and ensure that you understand the terms that are being used. And I, I have the example here in, in parentheticals, copay versus coinsurance. You know, it can be very easy if you're just kind of reading quickly to see co and skip over the rest of that word or to just kind of throw them together as the same thing. They are not the same thing. Um, a copay is a flat fee. So if you go to your uh, in-network provider, perhaps you have a uh, $15, $25, $30, for $35 copay flat fee. Coinsurance is a percentage. So if you see on your, on your plan that uh, hospitalization, the patient assumes a 20% coinsurance responsibility, well, that means that 20% of that hospitalization is going to be billed to you. So that's a, that's a huge difference. Two words that can easily be confused, but they mean, uh, they mean a much different things. So know the terms that are inside your plan. Learn about what third-party payment assistant programs may be available to you. There are uh, nonprofit payment assistant programs. Many of the manufacturers have payment assistant programs. Um, learn about those. Ask if you're unfamiliar with them, you can ask the social worker at your HTC, you can ask leadership at the, at the council or at the chapter, uh, but be aware of the resources that are there to help you with your insurance plan. Be prepared to educate, and this kind of uh, harkens back to the be patient, be persistent, and, uh, and don't preach uh, principles. Most of the people that you're gonna get when you first call into your insurance company's phone tree, they aren't gonna have a clue about bleeding disorders. Um, I think we've probably all been in that spot at least a couple of times. 
it can be extraordinarily frustrating. It can take way longer to, to get anything meaningful rolling than, than we would like. Um, but the reality of living with uh, a rare disorder, which that is what hemophilia is, um, is that we are just always in the position of having to educate. That's just part of what it means to be a member of this community. Um, so be patient, take your time, leave yourself enough time for those, for those moments and uh, take deep breaths along the way. Set yourself up for success. That kind of goes back to that principle of knowing what your intended outcome is. So develop your argument and set aside ample time to make sure that you can express it and educate and go through all those steps that we were just discussing. And once again, records help. I'm gonna keep coming back to this. Infusion and bleed logs, notes about clinical and hospital visits, notes and names from phone calls, et cetera. You know, all of our insurance companies, uh, we're not their best friends. I know I'm, you know, I'm sure, um, Blue of California would really prefer if I had another policy because I'm, I'm digging into their bank account as best I can as somebody at almost 200 pounds on, on prophylactic infusion regimens. Um, so it's important that we are our own best ally when it comes to articulating why our plan or why our regimen is what it is, how it's effective, why we need uh, tweaks when we need tweaks. Uh, you got to be your own best advocate when speaking to your insurance, your insurance company. Advocacies and pharmacies. Um, so once again, articulate your needs. You know, I think sometimes with our, with our specialty pharmacies or uh, 340B programs, when we're getting our factor, we can overlook simple things that make a big difference in our day-to-day -day lives, such as assay sizes. So if you're infusing um, uh, 2,500 IUs every other day, but you're getting assay sizes that are about 500 IUs, well, you gotta mix five different concentrates with the saline and five different things into the, Syringe, you got five times as much factor in the fridge. If you're going on a vacation or going off on a holiday to see family, you're carrying around five times more stuff. It, it may seem minor, but it's actually extraordinarily inconvenient if we think about the practical application of having these regimens and having in-home care. Uh, what needle and syringe preferences do you have? Again, may sound silly, but actually, uh, maybe some of you saw this. I actually set a, a personal record, what, a day or two ago? Um, and this is really embarrassing, but I'll be honest. It took eight sticks for me to have a successful uh, IV access to, to do my profi. Eight. I don't quite know why. I started questioning. I was like, wait, do I hate these needles or do I love these needles? I, I forget because I have my preference. I, they were the ones I loved. I don't know why I was struggling so much. But those are moments where I, when I have used needles that I'm less comfortable with, um, I do notice a difference. My anxiety goes up. My heart is racing. My blood vessels constrict a little bit. So articulate your needs. And help your pharmacy help you. Don't be afraid to ask for more help or accommodation when necessary. Uh, what you need may change over the course of time, depending on your health and depending on how things are going. Um, one thing that it is important to uh, mention, well, along these lines, that next bullet, uh, it, pharmacies and specialty pharmacies, 340B programs, they're very used to communicating with insurance companies. So these, uh, the individuals at these companies can often be helpful if you're having any specific insurance challenges don't be afraid to, to reach out for help. One caveat to both, uh, both of these last two points, pharmacies and, and industry and you know, the corporate partners in the community, so to speak, there are limitations on how they're able to help. There are things they can do, there are things they cannot do because they may be seen as inducement or it crosses a liability line. So just in terms of expectation management, um, if you do reach out and find that the, an indiv individual isn't able to help you to the full complement um, that you would like, uh, don't want you to go saying, well, you know, I was listening to this webinar from the council and Patrick said you'd be able to help. There are some limitations, but don't be afraid to ask. So a quick story about a, a friend of mine on the East Coast who um, ran into a, an issue, a very avoidable issue, but I think it's a perfect example of how uh, advocating with our pharmacy, it's something I think it's easy to overlook at times, uh, is really important. He, when he was a freshman in college, he had ordered his factor um, just before an upcoming break. And the factor arrived on, say, a Friday morning while he was in class. And when he went to the mailroom to go pick it up that afternoon, the mailroom had closed for the weekend. The mailroom was going to be closed the following week because of the, vac the vacation and the following weekend as well. So he wasn't going to have access to his factor for nine days. Uh, he, didn't, he, had, he simply hadn't thought that through. He hadn't thought through the particulars of, okay, I'm new to college. Where's my factor going? Um, will I be able to access it at any time? How does its delivery schedule and my class schedule interact? Uh, completely innocent problem, but unfortunately he was able to resolve this without big issue. But I think it just goes to illustrate uh, we can't overlook the importance of advocacy, 
even with things that may seem as simple and routine as home delivery and communications with our pharmacy. Along those lines, this is a little bit of a tangent, but for any parents who are listening, one thing that I always like to encourage um, when talking about, when telling that story about my friend um, is how important I personally believe it is to help your child uh, acclimate to the process of communicating with your pharmacy and scheduling delivery and managing and organizing the supplies at home as early as you see fit. Um, what, you know, with my friend, he didn't have a role to play with any. He had great supervision at home. He had loving parents and, and they wanted to take care of that for him. And while that instinct is of course wonderful, it didn't give him the opportunity to actually see what those phone calls are like, actually answer questions about, well, how many needles do you have left? Do you need any more gauze pads? Um, how many bleeds did you have this month? He hadn't done any of that. So his consciousness in college hadn't been developed. And that is why he ran into a problem with that mailroom story. So start thinking about at what age could you simply ask your child perhaps to uh, put the supplies away in the closet and how you've organized them and just have him lay out. This is where the syringes go. This is where the needles go. Then have him start making the orders. Then have him start interacting with the delivery individual so that little by little, he's taking on more and more of the responsibility and identifying as someone who needs to uh, develop these practices. And once again, records help. Um, it's also helpful to keep all infusion supplies well organized and managed and, and a record of those. I laugh a little bit because I travel a tremendous amount and I feel like I'm always scheduling deliveries when I'm on the road and invariably am poor at answering the question, so um, how many syringes do you have left? How many needles do you have left? I, I'm terrible at keeping a record of that and it's always a little bit annoying. So I have to take my own advice from this slide on advocacy and pharmacies. Advocacy and school. Um, so here's an area where we can really be proactive. Brought up earlier that I was gonna get to being proactive a little bit later in the webinar. I think when it comes to the school environment, this is one of the areas where your proactivity um, has one of the highest payoffs. Set up meetings with school administrators, nurses, teachers, phys physical educators, coaches. Once again, just like we said with the insurance companies and those phone trees, oftentimes schools are gonna be minimally familiar with von Willebrand disease, factor deficiencies, hemophilia, bleeding disorders, um, and they're gonna be thinking conservatively, they're gonna be thinking safety first, and while, again, those instincts, good, but can sometimes be um, actually, they can lead to unfortunate outcomes, and I'm gonna tell a story that illustrates that in just one moment. So be prepared to educate a lot and to repeat yourself a lot. Um, this is also an area where you wanna be mindful of your audiences. So we mentioned in the beginning, be mindful of who your audience is and the needs there will be different. So uh, we wanna be very clear about the educational needs. For example, uh, do, do you or your child require additional tutoring to compensate for absenteeism due to bleeds? Uh, do you or your child need extra time moving on crutches or with a wheelchair or with a cane or the really nasty elbow bleed through the hallways so you're not getting bumped and bruised, busing and transportation challenges? Those are conversations you're gonna be having with uh, school administrators and, and, and higher ups. Um, but when it comes to physical education and coaches, you're gonna to wanna to be talking more about what the physical capabilities and limitations are. So different arguments that you wanna be clear and concise about depending upon who the individuals at the school are. And I wanna double down on emphasizing the importance of communicating well with physical educators and coaches. Um, uh, powering through one of the programs that Believe does that I mentioned in the beginning. I was interviewing somebody for one of our upcoming panels in Idaho, uh, amazing teenager um, with hemophilia, who told me the story of how sometimes in, in school, in gym class, if the teacher doesn't feel that the activity is, is good for him because he has some knowledge of, of what hemophilia is through this young man's uh, advocacy, he'll just simply ask him to walk in circles. And when he told me that, it kind of broke my heart a little bit because this guy, and I won't go you know, knee deep into his story, but I mean, he's, he was basically the sole caretaker for his younger brother for a long time in his life. He is so articulate and mature, wise beyond his years, such a sweetheart, um, but he's so non-confrontational. Non-confrontational? Non ah, you know what I'm trying to say. That he never fully articulated what he is capable of with his PE teacher. So now he's in these positions where once in a while he's just told to walk in circles, which feels like such an archaic way to, to uh, manage a student with a bleeding disorder. So make sure that your communication is clear 
so that the, these physical educators and coaches in particular understand, yes, of course, your limitations, but also your capabilities. Um, these conversations will often also lead to opportunities to advocate in school. Another program I mentioned earlier, the Teen Impact Awards that Believe does at NHF. I just finished reviewing all the submissions uh, for our 61 honorees this year. And the number of people who had conversations with administrators at their school that wound up leading to doing a bake sale or doing a, a dance marathon or doing some kind of presentation in, in classrooms um, was pretty remarkable. And I thought, you know, I've never really kind of, I've never thought that if you start early in the school year at a new school, advocating with administrators and teachers, it also makes a conversation about, hey, would you be open to my trying to do this awareness raising opportunity or this fundraising opportunity? It makes those conversations much easier, much more organic. Um, so there's a nice relationship there between advocating for yourself with your school and advocating at your school for the community. Going back, <laughs> be mindful of your schedule. Do I have gym today? Don't forget to prep. Uh, this used to happen to me in high school. I, oh, shoot. Is today Thursday? Tuesday, Thursday? Yes. It's a day C. I don't have my shorts. Did I fuse this morning? Yes, I did fuse this morning, but I still don't have shorts. We have to be aware that when we have a bleeding disorder, and in particular in areas like gym class or anywhere that, uh, that physical exertion is, is underscored, um, we want to make sure we're doing our part to be prepared and not simply asking people to uh, accommodate us. Um, it, in other words, we don't want to be viewed as not taking care of ourselves and but annoyingly asking uh, coaches and teachers and administrators to you know, accommodate, accommodate, accommodate. Make sure that you're doing your work to be prepared. Otherwise, you can put an inadvertent target on your back as somebody who's not willing to do the work. Um, and often, you know, when this would happen to me in high school, it would be harmless, but a harmless thing happens once, not so bad. Twice, okay, three times and we got a pattern. So just be mindful to make sure that you're prepped like any other student. Uh, and again, records and doctor's notes help. Advocacy and elected officials, policy, lawmaking. Um, this, I think, is probably what most of us think about when we first hear the word advocacy. Um, though it is just one aspect of it, it is perhaps the most uh, well-recognized. So a few bullets here. Organized trainings and advocacy slash Hill Days are set up by the National Hemophilia Foundation, such as Washington Day, National Day of Federal Advocacy in Washington, D.C., um, held each year during the first quarter, and then this year due to uh, the health legislation activity, uh, there's actually a back to D.C. Federal Day as well. The Hemophilia Federation of America also organizes advocacy days. The Hemophilia Council of California has their Future Leaders program. Um, and then your local chapters work together along with the council to prepare for Leg Day or Legislative Day, which is our California uh, state uh, advocacy days. So Washington Day is on the federal level, Leg Day or Legislative Day on the state level. And I want to go back to those first words, organized trainings and advocacy. Um, the concept of sitting across from an elected official to uh, advocate on behalf of yourself and the greater bleeding disorders community can sound like an intimidating proposition. And I think for any of us who have uh, participated in either Washington days or, or, or leg days or any of these formalized uh, environments, the, the training that is provided is excellent and clear. The messaging is excellent and clear. You are set up in groups to go advocate in groups. Often there is one or two people that are the uh, actual constituents of the representative that you're meeting at any given moment. Those are the people who are, say, leading the meeting but you are rarely off on your own. You're rarely by yourself. So you have, a, you have support with you. It is not as intimidating as it may sound on paper. And for these in-person meetings, remember to know your objective, prepare that argument and story, make a clear and direct ask, be professional, be patient, and be persistent. And in this case, persistence meaning send a follow-up thank you or send a check-in. I've been in rooms where uh, the landing place before we've said goodbye has been uh, I really want to consider this, and um, and uh, I'll let you know my thoughts. Or um, I'm going to I'm going to think about this and discuss it with some colleagues, which is an opening for you to say, um, "Oh, that's excellent." Well, I'll I'll check in with you in a couple of weeks to to see if anything has shifted. Um, use those opportunities to check back in. Stay current. Regular email blasts, newsletter mailings, social media posts with information on pressing advocacy issues are coming out all the time. Keep in touch with community advocacy updates and action alerts. They're very important 
And again, what we just experienced with the rally to uh, voice opposition to the Better Care Reconciliation Act, the Senate health uh, bill that was, well, I guess it's still being discussed as maybe being brought to a vote. I don't know, just keep paying attention. But everyone is doing a really good job on both a, a large national level, on a grassroots level, on a very, very, very local level um, on getting that message out from our community. And that is important. So stay current, stay tapped in. Know your state and federal representatives. Keep a list of their contact information, phone number, email address, Twitter and Facebook handles, et cetera and keep in touch with them. Build a relationship with them over time. It goes a very long way, and that goes back to that be persistent, send a follow-up thank you, send a check-in. Um, if there's new information about something you spoke about in the room, feel free to send a, a concise and clear email with links to that updated information. The relationships we build with these individuals over time uh, go a long way, and again, as a small community, as a rare disease community, those of us with hemophilia, and even the larger bleeding disorders community, while we may have, if we think about all bleeding disorders, you know, a decent number of people, we're, we're not a very well understood community. So in any event, I consider us, or in any, uh, either way you look at it, I consider us rare for all intents and purposes. Uh, building these relationships is important for us. We need them. So if you start to generate one, keep it up. And again, records and props, Help. And I throw in that little props mention because uh, I think many, if we've been in those rooms before and been to these trainings, it seems as though it's standard at all of these trainings that we talk about how effective it can be to hold up that, that empty vial of factor from a previous infusion to say, you know, do you know how much this little vial costs? It costs $2,500. I take three of these a week. Um, that is a pretty powerful moment to watch people's eyes bulge as they recognize just how costly our care is. Okay, and finally, advocacy and social media. So th this is a little bit more of sort of a general uh, way to think about social media and advocacy, not so much a playbook as a, just food for thought. Um, in my opinion, when it comes to advocacy and social media, it is still very much so the wild, wild west um, with great potential for opportunity, like we saw with the amount of activity that went on around the Senate health care bill and some pitfalls. We can get trapped in some really unfortunate conversations, um, impartial, incorrect, or uh, inappropriate information can be shared around in, in ways that seem substantiated. So both highs and lows uh, when it comes to social media. I did uh, put in parentheticals here Matthew Gates and Gaga, uh, as some of you may know. So Matthew Gates is a community member of ours, a young adult uh, who I believe has hemophilia, but I'm not sure what his bleeding disorder is actually. Um, and Lady Gaga, was uh, on a, a show and she had, when someone asked her about the character she was playing in this TV show, she had made some reference about how the character was a hemophiliac for the following reasons and it was inaccurate and it was another unfortunate example of an inaccurate depiction or communication about hemophilia in entertainment. Um, and Matthew sent a very uh, generous 140 character tweet to Lady Gaga, um, simply trying to uh, not that I don't even say correct her, but just let her know like what it actually was. And she retweeted it with a personal message, um, apologizing and, you know, communicating that she intended no harm. Uh, and that got seen by her massive network. Now, how valuable is that in the long run? I don't know, minimally. But for a moment, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Lady Gaga's uh, social media orbit got to see a positive interaction between her and someone from the community about what hemophilia actually is. There's no way you can call that a downside. Uh, there's also no way that Matthew Gates and Lady Gaga are communicating about hemophilia if we weren't in the social media era. So there's some, some great opportunities for unexpected advocacy uh, when it comes to social media. Um, so speaking of Lady Gaga and her network, know your network and consider when you are uh, active on social media, your, your child's, your family's digital footprint. What we say online and put online tends to stay online, and it also reaches everybody, potentially, that we are connected to. Are you sure that you want that colleague, employee, employer, friend, et cetera, to know about your family's bleeding disorder or this particular uh, trouble that you might be having? Again, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer here, but it's important that um, we're mindful in, in thinking about that question. Be discerning about advice, tips, or rules given out in discussion groups. Care is personal and good intention can result in unfortunate outcomes. I am personally, I don't um, actively participate too much in some of the closed Facebook groups such as uh, Hemo Friends, 
but I do kind of just keep a, an eye on them to see what conversations are going on and uh, what kind of topics are being brought up. Uh, and I think those are extraordinarily valuable groups. Um, they're essentially the digital version of what we do when we get together at meetings or uh, dinners or uh, just socially. But we want to be careful to not take every piece of advice as, as, as a rule. Um, and while we as patients are experts on our condition, we are not scientists. Well, most of us anyway. We're not doctors, most of us anyway. So it's important that we just keep in mind the source of the information and use some, uh, use some discernment when thinking about what gets brought up online. Choose the pages and the sources of information that suit you best. Don't overwhelm yourself. I think that's very easy to happen. And I, uh, I know plenty of people who go on social media breaks or even uh, bleeding disorder community breaks if they just feel like this is becoming too much a thing in my life, I need to take a breath. That's completely fair. Um, take care of yourself. And uh, I would argue that there's a lot of redundancy. Uh, and if you were just simply to follow every organization in bleeding disorders and all their social channels, you're going to see a lot of redundancy. Um, you don't need to do that to yourself. Choose the sources that you feel best speak to you and provide you the information you need. And that's all. That's all you need to do. Be discerning in the shares and asks uh, you make of your network. Pause fatigue is a real thing. And this is something with the various programs and with Believe Creating Digital Content, you know, we always have something that we're sharing and we always have something that we want people to pay attention to. I'm sure people at the council and, and leaders at the chapters feel this way as well. And it can be challenging to uh, prioritize what you want people to, pay, to, to look at and think about because it all has value, right? But cause fatigue is a real thing. If we just think about ourselves as users, you know, if you have that one friend who it seems like every day has a new cause that they're asking you to donate to or a new thing they're asking you to look at, it's really challenging to kind of maintain patience for that friend. So you wanna be, uh, be discerning yourself and what you ask of your network uh, when it comes to social media. We talked about this with core principles, be mindful of your image as an individual, as a member of the bleeding disorders community, et cetera. Um, you represent yourself, you represent this community. Um, you have freedom of speech and you have freedom of expression but just be aware that what you say sticks. Don't get trapped in petty ego-driven arguments. You can see these kind of things happen on all kinds of topics all the time. And I, you know, I'm guilty of doing it. I, none of us are perfect, um, but just try to be mindful of the moments where you find yourself in some kind of rabbit hole to just pause, inhibit the impulse to go further and let it go. Take a breath, go for a walk, uh, you know, go pet a dog, unless you're allergic, in which case just go for that walk. Um, but do what you need to do to break away and take a breath. Um, and it's okay to do that. Seriously, it's healthy even to take a break. So we'll review these core principles one more time and then uh, move on to looking at some of the questions that have come in over the course of the last 44 uh, minutes or so. Um, establish a specific goal for your advocacy. What is your intended outcome? Develop a clear and concise argument. It is often useful to incorporate personal experiences. Educate yourself first others next, and avoid preaching. Whenever possible, be proactive, be prepared. Utilize community and your support network to help you. Records help. Log infusions, bleeds, calls with insurance, anything that helps you manage your care better. Keep records. Be mindful of your audience when you're advocating and be mindful of your image when you're advocating. And lastly, be professional, be patient, and be persistent. So with that, I want to just again remind you that this is the first in a new series of webinars that are being uh, educational webinars from the Hemophilia Council of California. Um, September 21st, Insurance 101, Preparing for Open Enrollment, will take place at 12 noon local time. And you can learn more about that and register for it at hemophiliaca.org. That's the council's uh, official website. And one um, uh, well, there was one other thing I just wanted to say that flew out of my mind. So I suppose we'll go to questions and that'll come back to me. I think I heard Robin chime in as well. And Robin, I'm going to try to click over here to the questions while keeping my screen shared. All right. Well, thank you again, Patrick, um, for that presentation. That was very informative. My pleasure. And so dive into some of the, the questions and comments. So... We had a comment from uh, Randall Curtis, HCC's president, uh, regarding uh, when you're a student and, and or parent of someone who is in a gym class, 
He suggested that you can get a list from your physical therapist and take that to the trainer. A list of approved activities from an official source can really help the gym teacher as well understand what can be done. Um, do you have any additional steps or um, other ideas on how someone could get specific guidance for a gym teacher? Yeah, so I think um, I think uh, Randy's suggestion is a great one, and that you know we I think we even even said in that school section, doctors' notes help. They go a long way. I'd also say um, I believe MASAC, uh, the National Hemophilia Foundation's Medical and Scientific Advisory Council, that's the body that's responsible for putting out recommendations with regard to uh, treatment product, product safety. They have recommended activities. Um, so if you wanted to use that list and, and bring that list to school as well to, to, to use as a jumping off point for a conversation with physical, physical educators, that could be useful as well. But I think Randy's suggestion of having that note from your treatment center is probably the strongest piece of, uh, strongest piece of paper you could walk in there with. Then we'd had another comment um, related to both uh, school and uh, social media advocacy, which is just to be careful about how much information you're putting out about your children if, if a parent is conducting that advocacy on behalf of, of a child. Um, just being careful what kind of, of digital footprint or public information is being put out um, about your child. Do you have any ideas or guidelines on how, how to walk that line about being helping to also be an advocate for your child and utilizing social media um, before your child is grown up and able to do it themselves? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's such a case by case sort of thing, right? But so when I've talked with parents about this before, uh, and I'm not a parent, so I, I think that's an important thing to state. So, you know, take my, take my uh, perspective for what it's worth. It's important for kids to, and, and I talk to campers about this kind of stuff, it's important for kids to understand the, the power and the long lasting impact for better and worse of social media. And I think if you're a parent of, of a child, engaging them with um, this conversation that you would like to be doing some social media advocacy, but it's not just your decision, it's also the child's decision. How do they feel about that? Include them in the conversation and get their take because they're gonna need to develop the awareness of how important it is um, the way they behave online. And this can be an opportunity for you to teach, uh, use this micro example of advocacy through social media to teach a macro lesson about the importance of considering your behavior on social media. And I think a lot of times we forget that even kids, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, they're a lot smarter than we give them credit for. And they're a lot more in tune with things such as the internet and social media than we give them credit for at times. So I, I guess I would recommend um, include your child in, in a conversation about what your advocacy uh, goals are when it comes to social media and ask them for their input. Again, it's a case by case scenario, but just I wouldn't underestimate the value of their input. And I think we have time for one final question. Uh, someone had asked uh, that if you can't travel to Washington to conduct face to face advocacy or Sacramento to conduct face to face advocacy, but you want to participate in concerted advocacy events, what other avenues does someone have? That's a great question because um, you know, advocacy isn't a once a year uh, thing. It's, it's all day, every day. Um, when it comes specifically to thinking about our representatives, um, I, I mentioned at, at one point, you know, they all have their phone number, email address, uh, social media handles listed. Consider writing a letter or emailing a letter um, or if they happen to be a representative who is particularly engaging on social media, perhaps that's a meaningful way to try to contact them. Um, that's a way that you can, can directly engage with them. If you wanted to, I've done this when I haven't been able to attend, uh, say, Washington Days. Um, I have done what I could online to help share information about registration and let my network know um, that this was going on so that I'm at least helping the cause if I can't be there. You can consider making a donation to places like the council or NHF or your chapter for their efforts. Um, you can make a donation explicitly with a note that you would like that funding to go toward advocacy efforts. Um, so th there are numerous ways to get involved. It just depends on what your, what your capacity is and you know, are you looking to just kind of generally support advocacy efforts or do you specifically have something pressing? Because depending on the level of urgency, 
uh, you know, you might want to go direct to your representative rather than say, uh, spend more time trying to promote Washington days. If you are having a specific issue, you want to handle that directly yourself. All right. I think that is the end of our questions and almost the end of our times. So I want to say thank you again, Patrick. Um, I think we can all apply these skills in some aspect of our life, if not multiple aspects of our lives. Thank you. Yeah, it was a, a pleasure to, to do this. I'm by no means a, a, an expert uh, here, but these are the things that I have, um, I have learned and, and, and read up on and acquired as I have um, had to learn what it means to be a good advocate for myself and for the community. And, and Robin, I think we had uh, talked just before this started that this webinar for anyone who wants to revisit it or if there's someone they'd like to share it with uh, will be available most likely just after next week's coastal ride. Is that right? That is correct. It will be available on HCC's website and a link will also be emailed to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you again for having me. This was a lot of fun to work on and, and I hope you all found it valuable. Thank you, Patrick. My pleasure. Goodbye. Bye-bye.